I wanted to ask you, and, and like, I definitely don't want to like tax your brain too much here, but could you give us a little bit of a tour of the highlights of psilocybin for depression research? Mm-hmm. Like, what do we re- what do we know right now about how effective psilocybin assisted psychotherapy is for the treatment of depression? So, I'm ba- so we really thinking about my own kind of experience of, of going through those two trials with people and remembering the people and the faces and the experiences. Um, so I think what I can talk about is kind of what I know. And then there's, mm-hmm. there's of course the data and that, you know, that it's the, the second study has just been written up for the new England journal of medicine. And so you can, you can find the, the outcomes there and the study results, um, which overall the, the key finding was that, I um, in the, the study that we did finishing in 2020, comparing psilocybin with an antidepressant, that they were both effective at reducing self-rated depression scores and that they were not significantly different. So the finding there was psilocybin and escitalopram both both reduce depression and they're not psilocybin isn't actually better that, than escitalopram, which doesn't really kind of tally that well with people's, you know, like with yes. like anecdotal reports. So I can explain to you, I think, the difference. Yes. If I could just say, it's it's a it, like when I first came across the finding, I was like kind of disappointed. Yeah. Right? It's like first of all, holy smokes, a study of psilocybin in the New England Journal of Medicine of all places, how cool! And then I, I you know, got to reading, and it's like, huh, mm. that's actually kind of a bummer. This yes. we're in a narrative here about psychedelics are about to save the world, <laughs> and basically, it's no better than you know these dreaded ubiquitous yes. SSRIs yes. that uh, mask symptoms and have these yeah. weird kind of like um, tolerance issues. And, mm-hmm. you know, every second person on the planet is taking them and we're still mm-hmm. a mess. Like, yes. okay, so bring us back to reality here, Ross. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, two things to say. In a moment, I'll talk about why actually it wasn't actually like those, those results in a way were quite misleading. And I'll explain why. Um, and that actually the experience of the participants, I think, were, were the, the psilocybin treatments um, were, were very much more um, much more approved of by them. Um, and I'll, ex- I'll explain why and why the study didn't wasn't able to capture that fully. Um, but also to say, based on your point about you know the narrative is that psilocybin is going to, I think there is in a way something quite something quite valuable in this finding of let's be grounded here and say you know it's it's working and it was safe for many people not working for everyone it's work psilocybin is working and it's safe and escitalopram is still you know one of the gold standard treatments so let's let's not go ahead of ourselves saying like it's the best thing in the world and and actually being quite respectful to our colleagues in psychiatry and psychology and saying you know um it's good to be humble walk slowly and be gentle in our um, proclamations about psilocybin. So I'm just giving that in there as a caveat that in a way, although obviously we were all kind of like, we couldn't pretend that we weren't hoping that psilocybin was going to come out significantly more effective. There was almost something slightly, there's something, well, you know what it's like with psychedelics. You work with psychedelics and you start to, you know, this mantra of like, trust the unfolding, like trust the way things, the innate intelligence of how things are moving forward. And, I did really when when you know when I realized it wasn't significantly different I felt the sense of um quiet okayness with that and that maybe that was where we are right now and that these kind of world changing narratives can overblow um psychedelics making them into this kind of big bubble that could potentially burst and and also this deep belief that I have that it's not actually the psychedelic it's the that they're amplifying the, the, the real medicine is the container, the therapy to relationship, and that psychedelics are beautifully amplifying that in a way that can make therapy so much more effective than otherwise. But that, um, you know, a, a paper in a journal like that, where it's very much focusing on the medical aspect of it as if it's like a drug intervention, putting too much emphasis on this drug being this kind of miracle drug, I think has problems and limitations too. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think what I really wish is that... Um, Going back to the first point about why actually psilocybin, you know, why the paper didn't really kind of uncover the, the nuances, I, I would have loved in a way, um, I suppose it's just different journals have different kind of styles, but 
I would love the softer story to also be told, which is, I guess, which I'll tell you now, which is, um, so in the study, the design of it was that we had two groups of people and they each went through the same therapy protocol. So that was the, um, the, the accept, connect, embody protocol, um, which I wrote beforehand, which is a very, very minimal protocol. It's, it's non-directive. It's just a framework for understanding the experience, which I can tell you more about in a minute if you'd like to know more details. But, um, but just to say that both groups of people so the escitalopram group and the psilocybin group both went through the same protocol, the same. So the people in this in the place in the psilocybin group, they had these two sessions with two therapists and the music playlist in this beautiful room, and they had preparation and integration sessions. I think like ten sessions all in all with with the therapists. So it was a you know therapy protocol with these two high dose psilocybin sessions, and then they had six weeks of sugar pills as well in between. The other group had um, the same thing, but in their psilocybin sessions, these music sessions with the two therapists and all of that, the, the psilocybin was just one milligram, but they still went through the whole psychedelic therapy protocol of holding the hands of visualizations, trusting themselves to let go. They had all the same guidance about surrendering. They had the incredibly powerful music playlist and they had a really strong bond with the therapist because you have to develop that bond, otherwise it's not safe to go ahead. So they had a really strong bond. And then many people found the experiences really profound. So, and then they had six weeks of escitalopram. Mm -hmm. So what it looks like in the journal write-up is we're comparing escitalopram drug and psilocybin <laughs> drug. Right. And the truth of it couldn't be more different. It's like, no, we're comparing, we're saying that, you know, all of these people went through this therapy protocol, which is different to normal therapy because it's not about changing your thoughts. Or, I, mean, I mean, that's very a, a bit kind of disparaging of me about CBT, but it's um, it's a protocol that's all about accepting, connecting and embodying. And they go through all of that with their two therapists that are allocated them for the whole period of time and the music. And no wonder both groups did well. And I really don't think, although obviously I can't really prove this, that it was the escitalopram in the low dose group. I don't believe from what they told me, from what I saw, that it was the six weeks of escitalopram that made the difference. I witnessed people in those sessions holding hands, being there, having amazing insights and not knowing whether they'd had psilocybin or not because they had a really powerful session and cried tears they hadn't cried for decades. So um, psilocybin, escitalopram, yes, it was all about the therapy. That's that's quite something, quite a different narrative yeah. um, than you pick up from reading the the journal article. Um, you know, this might be a bit of a tangent, but I recently read your colleague uh, Robin Card Harrod's piece about context, mm. right? And the, the possibility that um, one of the important mechanisms of action with um, at least, let's say, the the classic psychedelics is this enhancement of sensitivity to context. Mm. And that when the context that someone's in, in a psychedelic therapy is like, you know, one or two very caring, open, non-judgmental therapists, a room that's conducive to relaxing, letting go and, and healing, um, that it, that it, that it provides a kind of like, um, accelerator or, or catalyst, I think would be the best word, um, for the therapeutic uh, the therapeutic potential of the individual. Mm -hmm. um, somehow, um, in comparing the two conditions, we didn't see that sensitivity taking place. Although, were they taking the SSRIs um, before going into the two like experiential sessions? So the first session, no. So they had um, prep session, and then they had the so the first music low dose psilocybin session and then integration and then they started taking the daily escitalopram and then three weeks later they had another session so their second session they were on the antidepressant the first session they weren't really interesting so what do you make you know this is again a little inside baseball but what do you make of you know the hypothesis coming out of robin's model that it should create enhanced sensitivity maybe these participants were already very sensitive and already quite benefiting from the therapeutic relationship. Um, I wonder what's your take on that? Well, my take was that people came into the study with very high expectations. Um, 
compare that to the first study where people hadn't really, you know, there was not the same media kind of thing going on. So people came in with high expectations and they were really, really ready. And in order to get through, we had an incredibly careful screening process where, I mean, we were basically cherry picking, really. I mean, we were kind of really like choosing people who we felt were really, really ready. We um, chose people who were ready for the work, who were in supportive environments, who we felt would be able to safely go through this experience. So we were, I mean, we were really cautiously screening so I think by the time people came through to us and they were absolutely ready and primed and knowing this is a once in a lifetime experience and opportunity. Um, and then we have all this time to get to know people. I mean, you know, therapy sessions, 50 minutes and, but 50 minutes is such a short space of time to get to know someone. And it's the classic therapeutic hour, but in our prep sessions, we had lunch the day before the first session, we had lunch with people because I was really keen on how can we develop proper bonds and trust in a short space of time so we had lunch with people as you know equals the the the, the traditional boundaries of i am the expert and you are the patient went out the window and we sat as three human beings in a room listening to music eating our lunch together and just being with each other and we were there for lunch and then we had as long as we needed in the afternoon doing this visualization work together and it really forms a bond. So already by the time we went into the first session, I really felt like we were genuinely co-travellers and that you don't get that so quickly in therapy. Sometimes you don't ever get that in therapy. Hey, thanks for checking out that clip of the Mindspace podcast. You can get the full episode here on YouTube or check it out on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks and be well. Be well.